I am so honored and excited to have two of the leading luminaries of our field back on the podcast. Andrea, again, you have been on like for the 1700th time. And Dr. Margo, you were the first one on the podcast. You started it all for us in WIDA and you started it for my podcast. So today you'll be talking about your new book, with Corwin, Collaborative Assessment for Multilingual Learners and Teachers. Dr. Margot Kotlieb and Dr. Andrew Hagensfeld, welcome back to the podcast. You're welcome, Tan. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. So let's talk about the seed for this book. Every book has a seed. What was the seed for this one? I would say that our joint adventure <laughs> kind of began with um, our mutual passion for collaboration. And then we coupled that with our vision for assessment, which was how do you humanize this experience for multilingual learners or families and their teachers? We really thought about it. Um, Starting back in 2016, when we were at a Corwin retreat in California, and really it was the first opportunity we had to to really spend time together. And from that, this the seed kind of just kind of grew, and we were able to collaborate in a co-authored um, uh, chapter with Corwin with breaking down the monolingual wall. And then breaking down the wall. So we've been breaking down walls in two occasions. Um, and we've also, we, we've presented together and, and right now just engaging in this process of co-authoring is quite a collaborative adventure in and of itself. So I would say that would be the seedling, but in terms of the book itself, we see collaboration um, growing so much closer within classrooms and coupled with that with assessment, um, having classroom assessment, having much more of an impetus um, and becoming fully integrated within instruction. So it, it's collaboration on many different levels. Andrea, do you want to take it from there? Oh, absolutely. I would also say that it was a natural progression since previously I've already published on co-teaching, co-planning, and we often talk about that collaborative cycle, which we can for, certainly go deeper in in a little while. So co-assessment deserves its own publication, and it only made sense for Margot and I to team up, and we invited um, Dr. Maria Dove to write the foreword <laughs> to our book because she is ultimately a, a big part of this overarching effort to make multilingual education um, any kind of initiative that supports multilingual learners more collaborative, more integrated. So I would consider that a seed too, that it had to be the trilogy of co-plan, co-teach, co-assess so that we finish or start that entire cycle. Maybe we could start it with co-assessment to better inform our planning and instruction. I feel like the next journey you have to take is finishing the collaborative instructional cycle with co <laughs> reflecting. So you have co-plan, co-teach, co-assess, and the last one is co-reflecting. I'm sure that's in the works in the future. Let's see who you collaborate with um, on that journey, because this journey with Margo Godlib is going to be amazing. Let's talk about why should teachers embark on a journey through collaborative assessments? Can you provide an example of that to illuminate it? Sure, definitely. So I think we have to understand that at any given time, there are so many initiatives that take place in any context, in your school, in your district, in your state, any kind of educational context that you work in. So these initiatives cannot succeed if they are siloed. So it was natural for us to think about the heightened awareness and importance that's placed on assessment to be also made more collaborative, more integrated, so that we can focus on inclusive or integrated educational practices for our multilingual learners, regardless of the program model that they participate in. And when we collaborate, collaborative assessment allows us to more intentionally connect planning and instruction in support of multilingual learners, language, literacy, and content development. We look at data or evidence of student learning together. We consider multiple perspectives. 
every participating educator's input so we can gain a more comprehensive picture of how our students develop linguistically, academically, socially, and emotionally. I think, Margot, you might want to add to it or maybe even share some more details. Well, Why is it so important. important for you? Well, for me, as well as Andrea, co-planning and co-assessment are co-owners <laughs> because you can't have assessment without a planning phase. And so that became a natural kind of interactive activity that we can engage in sim simultaneously. I think that's critical. Um, assessment is integrated within collaboration. Every ounce of collaboration is part of collaborative assessment. And at the same time, assessment... Um, focuses on specific, as Andrea said, data collection, analysis, interpretation, um, looking at the target, see how well they met, um, go revisiting based on feedback where we should go next. So it's it, it, collaboration isn't something you do and then we assess, no. Um, and, and Andrea and I found that so true when we were writing the book, that in fact, co-assessment doesn't co-op collaboration, but the two go in tandem. When I first saw this instruction in cycle several years ago, it was illuminating. It was like, oh, I can co-plan during assessments during co-planning. It's not just what are you planning for tomorrow? It's thinking backwards and saying, what can we plan that is connected to the assessment? Oh, wait, we haven't planned the assessment. Let's maybe plan that. <laughs> so that is really helpful. Um, I love how you said you can't have... Um, assessment without a co-planning phase. So that's wonderful. Let's talk about the different parts of the collaborative instructional cycle. And then how is it different than the instructional framework in Andrew's book on uh, uh, that's about collaboration in other books? So in this book, we're introducing two cycles and then we'll bring that all together into a system. So I'm just going to briefly introduce or reintroduce the collaborative instructional cycle. And then Margo is going to share the collaborative assessment cycle. So that way you will see how the two go hand in hand and are in complementary distribution with each other. They don't, don't compete with each other. They complement each other. So if you think about the classic way that the cycle of collaboration uh, has been introduced, it consists of four phases, four distinct phases, but they're also intertwined, interconnected um, phases, such as co-planning. During that time, we focus our joint effort on implementing standards-aligned, standards-informed curriculum and to provide access to rigorous content and language to all students. Co-teaching, or sometimes we talk about collaborative instruction or, or co-instruction, because co-delivery might not always be feasible, but we still consider collaborative instruction to be an umbrella term when teacher, teachers forge a partnership, when they coordinate their instruction, they might not be physically in the same space, but they're coordinating, such as in a dual language context or in many other contexts, they're coordinating their instruction to be complementary to each other. Co-assessment is the next phase of the cycle, which Margot is going to talk more about how we had a cycle within a cycle or a collaborative approach to looking at data, uh, student progress, and so forth. And finally, as you suggested earlier, we have to close this cycle with collaborative reflection, our shared reflection with our students, with our colleagues on teacher learning and student learning at the same time. And then this just starts the cycle all over as we reflect on our impact on student learning and what additional opportunities we might have to enhance our teaching practices. I think you'll see many commonalities between um, the collaborative cycle and the collaborative assessment cycle um, because collaboration is at the root of both. Um, but with assessment, we're really focused on three different approaches, which we'll delve into just a little bit later. Uh, later. Um, but assessment is really the glue, I think, that really ties the collaborative um, process together um, because we act based on data, whether it's data generated from students, data generated from teachers, um, and so assessment really becomes the anchor. And as Andrea said, it oftentimes it's, it's standards reference. Doesn't have to be, but 
in this day and age, we're still reliant on many different kinds of standards, language development standards, academic content standards, ISTE standards, which are the technology standards, um, CASEL, which is social emotional learning. So we draw from that. We draw for that for instruction as well as assessment because the two have to mirror each other. Um, you can't have an assessment that's not aligned to instruction. So that that's kind of the premise behind it. So the planning phase is, is almost identical. I mean, it, to me, that's the common ground. And we move from the planning to collecting data. Now, we might be collecting data simultaneously, contingently within a classroom, within a lesson, or we can be planning for collecting data over a period of a whole semester. Um, again, it, it's contingent on whether the assessment cycle is um, just takes two minutes or, or a whole semester. Um, so that's part of the planning process. And then we're collecting data. We're organizing that information. Um, to whom are we giving feedback? Who's giving us the information? What do the what do, do students in particular, especially our multilingual learners, need to know um, where they are and where they need to go to next? What kind of feedback are students giving each other? Are students giving teachers? Are teachers giving families? So we see assessment as relationship building more so than anything else. It, it and with relationships, you have collaboration. So the third phase would be interpreting that information that's been collected, um, really thinking about it and provide very timely pointed feedback. And then lastly, we've got to take action based on the results. We just don't give information back, but what are you going to do with the, in, that information? How are you going to make a difference in those students' lives? How are students going to make a difference in their own lives? What What's going to move them forward? How are, can they engage in teaching and learning with assessment built into that process? So to summarize, the new in, uh, assessment cycle is planning, collecting, interpreting, and then acting. It, this is exactly what teachers um Teachers well, do. I forgot the little piece in for <laughs> after you interpret, you have to report that information. The reporting can be through the form of yes. feedback or it can be some kind of formal way of reporting. I when I look at share. Oh, sorry, John. Please go. We wanted to share an example. Uh, we have yeah, showcased so many examples in our book. We were fortunate to have worked with many educators around the United States and internationally, and how generous they were sharing their. Uh, challenges and opportunities with collaboration, especially with collaborative assessment. So the team that I'm thinking of right now, um, they are from Chelsea Public Schools in Massachusetts. And I'm particularly thinking of Alma Pezzo, the Assistant Director for Multilingual Learners Programs, and Jody Klein, the Assistant Principal of one particular dual language school, where collaboratively, the leadership team and the educators in that program identified a problem of practice. They noticed over time that they're looking at students writing either in Spanish or in English, but not holistically. They're not analyzing students by literate development in writing. They're not looking closely enough at those cross-language transfers and so forth. So they agreed on prioritizing and, and, and emphasizing the importance of collaborative assessment by developing a collaborative assessment protocol. They began small. They started this initiative on one grade level, just with the third graders. And their protocol consisted of looking at student work in both languages, closely examining the criteria of success that they established. Then they, they called it bucketing their students into different categories based on patterns of student language use but they were not categorizing or boxing those students into those buckets. They wanted to identify patterns and consistency across different students' language and literacy development in two languages. But the most important part of their protocol was to identify whole class strengths and growth areas. So they could then publicly uh, discuss, each teacher could report back, as Margot emphasized the importance of reporting and sharing on what the outcomes of these collaborative processes are. So they could share 
through guiding questions and um, refined forms of these protocols, what the students can do and how they can enhance the students' um, language and literacy development. And the most important aspect of this always was next step for instruction and peer support. So collaborative assessment became a um, support system for educators to wanting to work together and support each other. So with that example of the bilingual education program for the third graders, um, I'm thinking if, if this was the middle school, high school dual language program, if they are teaching content in two languages, even if I don't know uh, the content in science in Spanish, I can still sit with and be part of the team by looking at the data, by looking at students' work, by analyzing the standards and saying, are they aligned? And so even as an EOD who's maybe we're in a uh, Chinese and Mandarin program. I don't know Mandarin, but I can still be part of this program, this team by looking at what you're saying. I think I think what you're saying is co-assessment is not just writing the test and that's it. It's gathering data, oh my gosh. looking at students' work. <laughs> it's a relationship. Go ahead, Margot. you're gonna say something. No, I, I was gonna say uh, you were right in, in tune with the, the collaborative assessment initiative that it, it's, it's part of building confidence in yourselves as educators, becoming empowered to understand what data are and how to use it effectively. And then how to move, use the data and then how to move and make actions, which is part, which is the last part of your instructional right. cycle. To improve teaching and learning, of course. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, let's move on to sharing about collaborative assessment as learning, I before I go there, I still I wanted to tell you you were part of my interview process, Margot. Um, several years ago, I interviewed I interviewed at a school, and the principal asked the question. He said, "Please give me an example of assessment as learning." And I was like, oh, "Margot Godley made it to the principal's interview here," and, it, <laughs> and I was like, "Thankful that I have some knowledge of your framework, so I was able to talk about it." And I was like, oh. "It was a your your that." If that's an example of uh, your reach, if it has reached a principal um, at that level. So let's talk about assessment as learning. Well, I'm excited because to me, that that's the most critical piece of any assessment cycle, any instructional cycle, because it rests with multilingual learners. They are the focus of assessment as learning. It, it, it revolves around the students and part of their identity formation. Um, to develop confidence in themselves as learning, um, to become accepted decision makers. Um, so they, in fact, have multimodal options to choose from, to show their evidence for learning, that they are, in fact, um, engaged in engaged as part of that whole cycle that it rests with students as the drivers. So, and, and that's been ignored in large part. The, the, the students themselves are recipients and they're not the motivators, they're not the, 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 the initiators of assessment. And they in fact should be the people the, that really think about what's my target for learning? How can I show that this target has been met? How can I do this in one language and two languages through other multimodal ways, through videos or through webcasts or through any, any way that I can show my growth as a learner? Um, and we don't honor students as much as we should. And that's what I try to do with assessment of learning. And Andrea's come in and, and added this whole other perspective. Student-student collaboration has been so key. Um, one of the example that we have in our book, for example, is dialogic learning. And how, in fact, we'll start with the third graders, how they were trying to solve a math problem. It wasn't something on a piece of paper that where they had to do addition. They had to go out and explore and figure out how many kids there are in the school. Well, and they thought of all these different options. We can go to the principal's office and just ask, or we can go to all the different classrooms and, and see how many kids are in each. And, and you see this dialogue between these students, both are Latin students, 
And so you see this trans languaging kind of creeping in um, because they're naturally going to interface with their other language because they're in a social and combined with academic context. And, and so as they're talking, you also see them moving towards greater metalinguistic awareness. They start asking each other, well, what do you think that Suma is? Suma? You mean some? Oh, I don't mean just some kids. I mean, what's the total? Oh, total. Oh, that's the same in Spanish and English. So they are growing as learners as well as self-assessors in the process. So that's a prime example that you'll see. And I'm sure Andrea has many more. <laughs> oh, yes. We always want to give a secondary example, too, which is very different. Sure. We want to give a huge shout out to Alicia Owen. And I think, Tan, you know Alicia so, <laughs> as a secondary ELD, EAL coach and um, highly regarded educator. She goes to a lot of conferences to share her knowledge. She was generous to share with us one of her novel and fun ways of organizing peer editing sessions at the secondary level. So what she has done, she created a scavenger hunt for peer editing. And the scavenger hunt is a simple checklist with a prompt such as find the writer's claim and circle it, or find places in the text where reasons are offered to support the claim and underline them. And each time the peer reviewer found that particular item, they had to add a check mark to the scavenger hunt. So the teachers, the original protocol was for the teachers to distribute completed essays to students to make sure that nobody gets their own essay back, along with the co-created scavenger hunt prompts. The next step of the protocol invited students to engage closely with a peer's essay or writing piece writing sample with the scavenger hunt. Once that independent work was finished, students returned both the marked up essays and the scavenger hunt protocol. And there was always time given for students to offer each other further support, ask clarifying questions, or to offer further positive feedback, engaging in dialogue connecting oracy and literacy around that written piece. And she found this highly effective, very engaging. It didn't feel like yet another task. And it's a prime example of assessment as learning as the students deeply think about their own growth as well as offer peer support to each other. So if I could summarize both of your third grade example and your secondary example, um, assessment as learning it is like students driving their learning uh, it's not um, teachers dis, um, telling students what to do in their assessment. It's students reflecting, monitoring their learning, and actively engaging their learning. Uh, in one way, it's saying assessment as learning is differentiation from multilinguals. It's self-monitoring and self-assessment. And it isn't necessarily differentiation. It's the students rise into the occasion. Um and, and it depends who their partner is or if they're in a small group. There's going to be differentiation, of course, but that isn't the, the, the focus is on the student interaction. So let's move on to uh, assessment for learning. Can you provide examples for that? What that is first and then examples. Sure. So the most important dimension of assessment for learning is feedback. To get started with assessment for learning, we have to create multiple meaningful opportunities for students and teachers to engage in conversations about learning. So assessment is not something that's done to students. It is something that they have a, a critical role in and part in. So when we think about assessment for learning, let's also consider all the different ways that students and teachers can collaborate around learning. The first one could be Students and teachers co-creating integrated learning targets or objectives. Another dimension of it could be students and teachers co-creating criteria for meeting those objectives or learning targets. So again, as I mentioned, it's not something that just happens passively to the students. They continue to be playing an active role in their learning and the assessment 
um, dimension of their learning too. Another dimension of co-assessment for learning is students and teachers deciding on evidence for meeting those learning targets. How do we know that they've actually mastered or on track to mastering the learning targets or objectives? And most importantly, students and teachers giving and acting on feedback or reflecting on learning. So it's both student learning and teacher learning in this dynamic process. Margot, did you want to add to it? I think you did a phenomenal job. Of really I've learned from the best. I've learned from the best. <laughs> so of course, this is our collaboration and such an honor. Of course, I should have started the whole interview with that to <laughs> collaborate with Margot about collaboration and combining our areas of interest, passion, and expertise. So it was it was a beautiful process. Definitely. But with assessment of learning, we're forging those relationships. We're building on those relationships um, in a very trusted and welcoming environment. And, and that interaction between teachers and students and students and teachers become solidified. Um, and that's so important for our multilingual learners, many of who are, you know, are entering the, the classroom having, you know, being subject to trauma and, and, inadequate uh, housing or being able to, to say that they hadn't been to school. Um, and, and, and that trust building is so critical to assessment for learning. Um, as Andrea said, it's a co-learning um, experience for both teachers and students. And since you mentioned that trust building, Margot, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to share a very powerful experience I had a couple of years ago when I was visiting Samantha Blanks and Ashley Rovner's class. It was a middle school, um, suburban Chicago school district that they were co-teaching. And then something truly unexpected happened as I was visiting the classroom, entering that shared space. A student ambassador welcomed me to the class and explained her role, her title that she is um, she has that role that whenever somebody comes to visit, she will have to uh, explain anything that's happening in the classroom to the visitor and um, offer any kind of per perspective or explanation that I might have about the interaction in the classroom. And I thought that this was such a powerful example of student leadership, agency, an authentic opportunity to see academic discourse happening with and among the students. But then came another very powerful surprise in this classroom that further adds to that trust building that Margot just mentioned, that some, as this student ambassador just quickly pointed out a few details about what I would see on the um, bulletin boards that are that were very rich in unusual content in this particular classroom. So one such unusual, feature of a bulletin board was a monthly student activity sign-up sheet. So there were dates and exact times, exact non-school or maybe school-related locations, and then the name of a student and an activity. So these two teachers took collaboration to the next level, trust building to the next level, that kind of interaction to the next level by inviting, actually asking the students to invite them to their extracurricular events whenever the teachers, one or both teachers could event a sport, music, or even birthday parties or family events, one or the other teacher or sometimes together they went. And I saw things like baseball games, games, gymnastics practices, even a family birthday celebration in the park in a public space. And it all showed how important it was for these teachers to value each and every member of that class community. So you could see that in this environment, looking at learning, looking at assessment and looking at student agency all have a very different meaning. That's and learning isn't confined to school. Um, even though we haven't had much opportunity to extend it, we acknowledge families as the, absolutely part of that assessment for learning. Because students, when they go home, their part of the assessment process is extending it to their family members. Um, so we've included interviews with families. We have sought out families as um, the resources 
for interaction. Uh, so we, I, I wanted to emphasize that piece that learning isn't just confined to school, that it, it extends into the community and absolutely um, the family's wealth of knowledge. And I could see that working as like, if there's a topic where the parents can add their absolutely. experience or they can go into a part of the community um, and then they can learn from that part of the community. They can go to the mosque, they can go to um, like a local market, they can go to um, an artisan and they could learn from that person connected to their summative product, a summative project that they're learning. It's like hands-on research with the community's help. <laughs> Let's look at the last part, which is assessment of learning. What does that look like for teachers and students? You just mentioned that, Tan. Um, this is the, the opportunity where we can bring in the community and the families because we gain multiple perspectives from each one of our students um, with assessment as learning. It is broader in scope than the other approaches because it's more comprehensive. It can include what you said is summative assessment, um, and that might be, you know, tests that are given to all students. But that's just one piece. It's one data source. And we need multiple data sources in order to make effective decisions. And with assessment of learning, we really tie learning to specific products, projects, or performances. Not only individual students, but groups of students. And that enables the students, again, to further that relationship they, they have internally in school, externally in communities, and with their families. As you just mentioned, how can we bring in those families' funds of knowledge? How can we couple that with the students' funds of identity um, to, to enhance and enrich learning? Um, that, that's the, the real purpose behind assessment of learning. It's not only tied to lessons, but how those lessons can um, scaffold on each other to build into a final product, pro project, or performance. Um, for example, in the book, um, we looked at an intermediate school, and they tied assessment of learning to portfolios and to student-led conferences. So students, in fact, are collecting their own data over time, and they're showing um, through teacher interviews what they have accumulated. The teacher is the guide. The teacher and the students delineate what's in it. Um, so as, as Andrea has mentioned, we went into Indiana this time, and Rebecca Gardling, she, she was just so... Um, well organized in how she collected, interpreted, and provided feedback on those data um, through assessment of learning. And she tied that to student-led conferences on a quarterly basis. And with the student-led conferences, the, the students are um, aggregating their own little data over time and showing the teacher their evidence for learning as delineated across all their core content subjects. So it wasn't just language learning, it's language integrated with content um, to, to apprise the teachers as well as the students as their um, growth over time. And what we really appreciated about Rebecca's example was that they did it four times. So it was not just, again, one and done. It's a journey, as you mentioned earlier, Tan, and Margot and I chose that as a metaphor for the entire book, that it is a journey to be on this road to successfully assess, plan, and in implement instruction for our students. So what I liked about Rebecca's work, in addition to what Margot presented, was that at the end of each quarter, the students were invited to choose a new goal or a more refined goal for themselves, both as far as their content and language and literacy development are concerned. And that's integral to assessment as for and of learning. So as I'm listening to your examples, I'm just thinking about teachers who are listening to this podcast and they're saying, what about newcomers? What about translanguaging, which you've somewhat mentioned. Could you talk more about that? How, and then the last one is like, you talked about groups. How, how do we assess multilinguals in groups? So those are three different questions. 
Yeah, maybe I'll just mention first the newcomer, the re a possible response, that it's even more important for us to come together and to get as much information about our entering students before we even know that they're at the entering level of language proficiency, but they are entering a new cultural context. They're in a new school, they're in a new country. There's just so much that we need to find out about them from multiple perspectives. So co-assessment, collaborative assessment, working together with our colleagues is even more important, both at the initial intake as well as progress monitoring, and sometimes very important decisions that are made about newcomers. And Andrew say inviting them into the community of learners, that's so critical. Um, I would also hope that um, collaborative assessment involves the students other languages. So we really have a fair and, and reliable and hopefully much more valid inference when we look at those data and, and understand the context, understand the background of the student, their experiences, their languages, their cultures, and what they're bringing to um, schooling. They may be newcomers to the school, but they could be 14 years old. So they are not newcomers to this earth. <laughs> and we have to realize that um, and not treat them uniformly. Each one comes with their own story. Um, in terms of translanguaging, that's very much a part of co-assessment, depending on the the instructional model um, and we honor each and every one knowing that there's myriad ways of instruction when it comes to multilingual learners that in some cases translanguaging is very apparent um, during learning um, but not showcasing learning especially in assessment of learning um, if it's part of much more of a, a group or um, uh, a school-wide project that ultimately the, the end product might be in English, but the whole process could be in multiple languages. Um, and all teachers must understand when they're drawing from multimodal resources, one of those modes is that students are their language, and that is to be part of the uh, co-assessment. I mean, you also wrote a book called Assessment in Multiple Languages. So, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, teachers can all done that along the way. <laughs> We've done many, many things along the way. Um, yeah, but but that isn't emphasized in the book. But it, it's 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 heart and soul of who we are. Um, we never deny that student their languages and cultures. It's very integral to teaching, learning, instructing, and assessing. Well, since most of our students uh, come from communal backgrounds, but where the community is part of the culture, um, collectivist communities, what can we do when we are co-assessing, when we are looking at groupings or groups as they're doing assessments? I'll begin, but I think Andrea can jump right in as well. Um, you notice what students are doing. Uh, you look at their interaction in the small groups. You see um, how they're contributing um, in one or many languages to that discussion. You may instigate further, you know, um, speaking or a Socratic seminar where there is a small group, but they're challenging each other. And you as a teacher becomes a note taker. Nothing more. You're observing and you're taking notes. Um, and so the interaction is so critical with assessment as learning in particular, that you don't want to interrupt that. You just want to be the noticing person behind that. So Andrea, want yeah, to I was thinking something very similar that um, for us as educators, there's an amazing, humbling opportunity to learn about our students' cultural language practices. As you said, if there's a group of students if there happens to be in a school community, a large influx of, I'm just saying a, a Turkish community all of a sudden, or um, a previous cultural group that might not have been present in a school community, we as educators need to learn about those cultural and linguistic practices, those patterns of language use, uh, interaction, um, norms and expectations. So we become the learners and our students are empowered by way of teaching us about some of those um, 
funds of knowledge and funds of identities that they bring with them. So that is one way to reach beyond the classroom. With collaborative assessment, another way that we very strongly advocate for towards the end of the book is to bring those previously unpacked cycles of collaboration, the instructional cycle and the assessment cycle, and shape them into a system. So I think that's also a pretty powerful contribution in our book that we brought together based on our expertise is how to establish a collaborative assessment system when we consider who is involved, what the key components of this system could be, and most important, how can we ensure equity through cultural responsive and linguistically sustainable assessment practices and tools. We pay so much attention to honoring our students' voice and choice and create a balance of documentation among assessment as for and off learning. But ultimately, everything is anchored in multilingual students' assets. Did I summarize that okay, Margo? Because this is just such a wonderful you do phenomenal. Uh, and we come full circle because we begin our book with a set of norms. Yes. And number one is multilingualism is the norm. Collaboration is a norm. So what would that system look like? You talked about um, how can we take all of these cycles and put them in a system? Can you give an example? Or So one example, I'm just going to take you now to one of my long-term colleagues and collaborators, Jill Iobase uh, context in West Ada School District in Idaho. She's been in a couple of school districts since we have been working with her and supporting her. So for many years, she has placed a very important in her school districts, placed a very important um, importance on an emphasis on ongoing coaching support for collaboration. So it doesn't happen in isolation. It doesn't happen because one teacher wants to do it or is inclined to do it or is very, very good at it but it becomes the norm, as Margot mentioned. So collaboration is not a choice, it's not an option, it's a must. So within this context, there are school level and district level coaches who continue to learn among themselves, as well as they facilitate conversations and ask really good questions that lead to reflection and clearer communication, communication around student needs and most importantly, student assets and student strengths. So sometimes if teachers happen to be new to this type of collaboration, then that instructional coach initiates the conversations, introduces each of the cycles to the teachers, to the participating educators, and they walk through student data and evidence of student learning in a non-evaluative, non-judgmental way. The learn is, the goal is never to, um, blame and shame any educator in this process, but to continue deeper learning and deeper understanding around student learning and assessment. Peer visitations, uh, positive peer visits to classrooms, meaning educator visits, is also an important part of this type of systemic support for assessment and collaboration. Let me go one step further in saying, to me, the system is a whole school effort. That's where collaboration kind of, you know, makes its move, um, not only throughout a school, it could be a district-wide commitment, uh, for, starting with multilingual learners, not top-down, but bottom-up, um, where we have this mutual support and admiration, really, um, with shared goals. And only then can we move, push the button, change our mindset. In, ensure that we can advance our educational endeavors for multilingual learners and their families. Is that, I feel like we, just with that last response, responses, we, we answered the last question of like, how do we take collaborative assessments beyond the classroom? And I, and I think that your answer was the system. And so if admin mm -hmm. is listening to this, which many are, um, many do listen to the podcast, then they have to create the space within the time schedule, but they also have to create the policies and the culture to say, we're doing this as a team. This is the culture of not just one school, but the entire district. Is there, let's end the podcast with this. Um, what is one action you would like teachers to take now that we've gone through your entire book very briefly, what is one simple action that you would like uh, teachers to take after listening to this podcast on assessing, co-assessing for multilinguals? 
Gosh, I would say um, listen to your students. Encourage your students to talk to each other um, and form a community of learners. My answer is similar to Margot's, except I'm focusing on teachers listening to each other, withholding judgment, respecting each other's differences in perspectives, honoring each other's rich experiences in the classroom and beyond. So for collaborative assessment or any kind of collaborative practice to be successful, teachers need to forge and nurture partnerships. So that would be my takeaway. Well, you have helped us on this journey to forge and nurture partnerships on a journey of co-assessing. You have lit the path and also planted rest points, but also planted roadmaps or signposts to say, keep on going. Uh, together. And so uh, Dr. Margot Gottlieb and Dr. Andrew Huggensfeld, thank you so much for allowing us to listen to you along this journey through your book. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's just, and, and the journey has been remarkable for both of us. Mm -hmm.